Okay. Um, you know, once again, thanks to Greg Rivak for letting me participate in this uh, program. Um, uh, a little bit of background, Matt Cook, Coach Cookie, uh, I've coached every level from uh, Mites through college. Um, but what I want to talk about today, the topic Greg gave is basically character development through hockey. And uh, I'm going to break this down into the four age groups, Mites through Bantam. Because in my mind, what makes hockey different from other sports, um, especially because you have a large percentage of the kids whose parents did not play the sport, is that we have an opportunity to have the kids take ownership of the sport. So let me go through each level uh, and talk about what I mean by ownership. Starting with the mites. Uh, you know, mites are going to have parents in the locker room helping them get dressed, and that's fine. But I want to be able to develop the mindset that the mite player is responsible for packing his own equipment bag. So back when I had mites, I mean, we would take a little card, laminate it, put it on a string, hang it up wherever they stored their equipment, and had instructions that says, here's how to pack a hockey bag. Take your hockey pants, throw a shin pad in each leg, throw a hockey sock in each leg, throw in your cup and your garter belt, bang, now you've got the lower half done. And then proceed with that so that the child is responsible for packing their own equipment. Now, that's really about as much as you're going to get out of mites. Um, you know, and I will tell you that, you know, we had a situation where, you know, if a kid forgot a piece of equipment, you know, he had to wear that card around his neck during practice. I'm not sure we could do something like that anymore. Um, but, you know, once again, it was a different time. But you want to have the players take ownership of just what's going to happen away from the rink. And one of the other things that I tried to do is towards the back end of the mite season, we would have a mite practice where no parents were in the locker room. So literally the coach and coach Ez had to get there probably 45 to 50 minutes before practice. All the players got there and they dressed themselves. Now, you know, you're probably going to have to tighten skates a little bit, something along those lines. But once again, we want to get that mindset that the kid owns it that it's his responsibility. And it's probably the first time athletically that an eight-year-old is gonna be treated like an adult, that he's gonna have that kind of responsibility. And if you can get the buy-in for that, now suddenly the kid's responsible, not only for packing his own equipment, but you know for creating his shooting station at home, for creating his stick handling station at home. It, it, it's absolutely the right start. So, you know, once again, it, it can be frustrating and, and, you know, you say, well, I'm, you know, here to do X's and O's. No, at the might level, you're not. At the might level, you're trying to help these kids become passionate about the sport. So then the transition that we make to the squirt level, uh, and, you know, once again, you've got to have a parent meeting to get them to buy in on this. But once they're in squirts, as soon as that kid goes from the lobby to the area where the locker rooms are, it's his. Mom and dad stay in the lobby. So, you know, once again, as the squirt coach, yes, you're gonna have to help kids get dressed, et cetera, et cetera. But you wanna be able to, to create that environment where the switch goes from mom and dad running the show to the player running the show. And once again, you know, not everybody's gonna buy, on, buy into this. You're gonna have some pushback from parents but I think it's just incredibly helpful for the kids to start to get that feel that it's theirs. And once again, if, if the kid believes it's theirs, you don't have to worry about motivation as much. Now, the tough one is when you make the transition from squirt to peewee. Um, you know, anybody who's coached peewee will tell you it is the toughest age. Um, you know, in the old days, we'd say that, you know, the problem with peewees is they're too young to hit and too old to intimidate. Um, and you know that the peewees are going to screw up. But peewees is the age where I try to let the players have the room. Where the players dress without the coaches in the room. Now, it's never going to work perfectly all season. I mean, kids are going to start locker boxing or, or, 
you know, whatever it is that peewees do. But it's important that the parents understand where you're going with this. Let the parents know that at some point, those kids are going to screw up being in the locker room by themselves, and the coach is going to take the locker room away from them. And if you really want to motivate kids, tell them that they're not worthy of a locker room, make them dress out in the tunnel. That will bring the lesson home, you know, not only the discipline of being able to have your own room, but the discipline that's required in our sport. But the parents need to know that, yes, this is going to happen. Now, obviously, you want to create a safe environment, and not every peewee team can be trusted to have their own room. But I do believe you should give them a chance. So, and then the last area I want to go to is Bantam. And, and this is where, you know, the C on the sweater means more than just the coach's kid. I mean, this is where you get to the why. If you're talking about why you're doing certain drills with mite squirts and peewees, that's probably a waste of time. Once you're at the Bantam level and you can bring the captains in and say, okay, here's what I'm looking at as a practice plan. Are there any areas that you think we need to focus? Are there any particular skills that you think we need to develop? Um, you know, have a different kid on the team pick what game you're going to play at the end. But once again, you want to put the responsibility onto the captains, which bleeds down to the players. And is it the most efficient way to do things? I mean, absolutely not. And are they going to make some dumb decisions? Uh, yeah, of course they are. But once again, it's their decision. And, it, you know, it's not as if they say, I want to do A, and if I want to do B, we're still going to do B. But I want to hear why they want to do A. And once again, it, it, if the kids feel that ownership, that's where I think we make a leap in development, especially character development in hockey that we don't make in other sports. So Greg, I hope that came in on, under time here, but um, you know, give me the questions that you have that you wanna flesh out different areas. I think we should uh, continue to go up the chain here. Let's maybe talk beyond Bantam. Obviously, you're doing college now, and you've had some kids who recently went through high school and are into college. So maybe just a little bit into that. I know we don't want to dip too far um, and go too deep on that, but I'll, I'll get some follow-up questions beyond that. Yeah, and here's the problem. Once you get to high school, you're talking about an adult whose job it is to coach that team. And, and if he loses too many games, he loses a job. I mean, and, and that's... And that's the difference between youth and high school. And it's really tough. And, and that's the reason that I hated high school. You know, I, I never got, I mean, it was never my livelihood to coach high school. But, you know, you have too many screw ups and next thing you know, you're fired. You know, and it doesn't matter if you have, you know, 15 boneheads on the team, you're the guy who's going to get axed. So it's, it's really I mean, that dark area is high school and I understand our end juniors and I understand why high school and junior coaches don't want to give kids that opportunity because their livelihoods are at stake. And, and you know, even when you're at a AAA level, say, you know, you're getting paid, you know, 10 grand to coach a, uh, you know, U18 team. It's tough. It, it, it's really a very dangerous thing if the parents don't understand the objective. If the parents think it's about wins and losses while you're trying to develop character and ownership and responsibility, it's not going to end well. So that's why I think that most high school, that's why I think a lot of high school coaches tend to micromanage and especially junior coaches try to micromanage. So, but, um, you know, the college thing is a, is a separate issue. So Greg, come back to me. Is there something you more, you want me to hit on high school? Cause basically we've got youth, high school, junior, and then D2 college. And those are three different conversations. So well, I think that there's an underlying piece here and, and you've talked about it is getting parents on board. So maybe explain what you mean by that and how you kind of go about getting parents on board with understanding the ownership and allowing players to take on more and more. 
All right, start with the might level. And, and this is the killer thing a parent could say in our sport. Tommy, if you score a goal, I'm going to give you 20 bucks. I mean, that is a death sentence for development of a team. Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't fault the parents, especially parents who don't know the sport. And, you know, look, you know, my dad used to say, if you want to get a ride home, get your name on the score sheet. You can have a goal and assist or a penalty, just, you know, get on the score sheet. But there's that mentality, especially in a sport that attracts relatively wealthy parents, that a financial bribe uh, is what they think is the way to encourage. And, it, and you and I both know that it's 180 degrees wrong. You know, it, uh, so trying to find that way to talk to parents and look, you're not gonna win every battle with parents. You know, it, it's the standard joke in our job that the greatest job in hockey is coaching an orphanage. Um, but you got to try. You got to try to get the parents to embrace. Here's how the game is played. Here's what we're trying to do. You know, here's why being able to make that great, you know, bust up a two on one is way more important. Here's why it is a cardinal sin to take a penalty in the offensive zone. Um but it's really, really tough because you've got to bring the parents along and raise their hockey IQ. And to start that with someone in their 30s who hasn't played the sport, man, that's tough. And, and you know, I wish I had more answers on that. But it, it, it comes back, you know, once again, to letting parents know what the responsibilities are at each level. You know, mites are development for squirts. Squirts are development for peewees. Peewees, you're trying to win. But you're also trying to develop the bottom part of your roster without crippling the top of your roster. I, I hope that makes sense. It does. And uh, since we're talking about ownership, character development, ownership development of the sport, uh, I think it's only fair that we talk about uh, the University of Akron and the Life U program that you've put together there. I think this just ties in exactly with what we're talking about. Yeah, and, and you can only get that when kids realize that they're at the top of their pyramid. I mean, if the University of Akron was a step before they went on and played a higher level, we'd have a different situation. You know, but all of our kids know that if they were better hockey players, they wouldn't be playing at University of Akron. They, they would not be pay, playing D2 College Club. So now you're at the point where they recognize that the stuff that happens off the ice is way more important than what happens on the ice. Um, you know, it, it's one of these things I've said, um, you know, when you ask me to write a recommendation letter for you for a job, the employer is not going to care how many goals you scored. You know, the employer is going to want to know if you're punctual, if you're presentable, if you speak clearly, are, you know, can you handle a task? Um, can you handle criticism? Uh, you know, those are all the things that we can give in D2 College Club that are valuable to an employer. You know, it, it's not how many goals did you have on the power play? But the kids have to have that sort of a Santa Claus moment where, where they realize, okay, no, this, this is my terminal velocity. This is the last time I'm going to play uh, with the name of my sweater. That's not some bar. You know, I, I'm not stuck in beer league for the rest of my life. This is the last time I get to represent uh, an institution, a school. So from a development standpoint, and we've done a pretty good job of letting them know what the expectations are before they get to Akron but they understand that what we do with Life University, what we're doing off ice uh, is way more important than what we do during practice time. So what do you feel is the most important? I'll talk on Life U after this and exactly what it is, but Life U itself, what do you think the most important thing is that either you do or the kids get from it or take away, or is it, you know, one kid's taking notes and he now has to, you know, deal with the pressures of getting it to his teammates in a sensible way, or, or maybe what are a few elements? 
it, it comes down to giving the kids a chance to fail, um, letting them know they failed, letting them know what they can do to get better. So to me, Life View, or I should say College Club Hockey, is a way to recognize a mistake and grow from it. You know, and it's not the mistake of not getting the puck out of your own zone. It's the mistake of, hey, you know, we were supposed to have the water bottles at the away game and you forgot them. Okay, <laughs> you know, the, those are the types of mistakes that we're trying to get through. Um, you know, a mistake of not dropping a class or not getting to a tutor or showing up late. Um, those are the mistakes that we want to acknowledge and learn from, um, you know, in that college phase. And, you know, it's amazing. And Greg, you can speak to this as well. The college years go by so quickly for the players. I mean, they're, they are absolutely at light speed as opposed to maybe the time they had in peewee. You know, so even though they're, you know, four or five years playing in the college level, it goes so quick. Um, and, and let me go back a, a little bit more back to youth hockey, especially once you hit the Bantam, because I, I had it written down and I didn't mention it. When you're talking to those uh, captains and say, okay, what do we need to work on? What, you know, where, where do we need to get better? Now you're doing something that breaks what I think is killing USA hockey. You're getting from the mindset of saying we need to do flow drills versus we need to do skill development. And it, it's not that I think flow drills are terrible, but if you don't have the skill to execute the flow, it's a waste of ice time. Yeah, and in our barn, we're spending 350 bucks an hour for ice. So wasting $40 of it, doing a 10 minute flow drill uh, is just criminal to me. But if the players understand, okay, we're going to work on this skill. And yeah, maybe it's stuff we were doing in sports and mites. But as we see us get better during this skill, then take that particular skill, move it into a small area game, then take that small area game and take it full ice. Now I think the players and the parents understand why skill development uh, is the most efficient use of ice time. And, and you could probably go on about Greg Rivak being a pain in your butt of why, why, why. And uh, that was a good way for him to start seeing the full picture. <laughs> there, there might have been a little pushback at first. And, and this goes to something that, that coaches, and Greg, this is something I've talked to you about. If you have a really talented player who's a coach, sometimes they forget the struggle. And, and, you know, not everybody has the same skill level. And there's a real good reason why you don't have Hall of Fame players winning Stanley Cups as coaches. You know, what the, the way you process something, the way that I know that if, if there was a skill you wanted, I had complete confidence that you're going to be in a stick handling station getting 10,000 reps and owning that skill. 10,000 correct reps and owning that skill. That's not everybody else. So, and, and that goes to a different point of how to structure a coaching staff, which would be a whole nother uh, lecture, but it, it would be, in my mind, it would be great to have, uh, you know, a top-down guy who's watching what the other coaches do, have a guy running the D zone, the O zone, the goaltenders, and then having someone like a Greg Revac who can go player by player pull them out of a drill and say, okay, here's how you're trying to do the skill. Why don't you try doing it this way? And, and if you can end up with a situation like that, I, I, I mean, you will, the development will go at warp speed. But like I said, that's a separate lecture. Awesome. Well, wrapping this up, um, one, if you could uh, give us the mistake protocol and then two, if there's anything written down that uh, you may have, just missed over, uh, just with the flow of everything, we can circle back on that. But otherwise, I think uh, ending on those two items, mistake protocol and anything in your notes is, is a good way to end this. Yeah, the, the big one that that's in the notes is start with why. 
you know, if, if I were to ask a coach, why are we doing this? I would get my head ripped off. I mean, that was the seventies. I mean, you, you just, you, you never dreamed of asking that with this generation, which I think is a great generation. You have to give them the why. Okay. We're going to do drills a, B and C and here's why. And if you can get to the why, especially at a Bantam or a high school level, I think it's very powerful. Um, as far as mistake pro protocol, you know, four-step process, acknowledge it. Oh, damn, I screwed up. Apologize for it. Sorry. Yeah, I could see where that was bad for the team. I don't want that to happen again. Learn from it. Next time in my, I'm at that decision, what are my other options? And then most importantly, drive on forget about that mistake and move on. This, this is a game of mistakes. It's too damn fast. You have different sizes, you have different speeds, you are going to have mistakes. And the, and the hard part is that what wasn't a mistake, what was a great play in mites is a really stupid play in peewees. So the mistakes change over time. But the big thing that I want coaches to know the, the big thing I would like coaches to embrace is don't try to prevent mistakes. Try to prevent the same mistake over and over. You know, nothing teaches like failure. And you don't have to embarrass a kid about this, but if you pull the kid aside and say the most important words any coach could say, here was the situation, what did you see? Okay, that's what you saw. What were your other options? perhaps what could we do differently? Excellent. Well, thank you, Matt, for your time and your expertise here. Uh, there are plenty of other topics that we could dive into based off of that. Um, and I'm sure we will on the Hockey IQ podcast at some time, but thanks again for uh, presenting. I really appreciate it. So, Greg, once again, always a pleasure. Uh, and, you know, I got to keep saying, uh, you know, I told you six months ago, the hockey IQ is getting better and better, and it's still getting better and better. So, um, you know, uh, coaches, players, parents, uh, if you're not subscribed, uh, it, that is a mistake. You talk about an incredibly efficient use of time. Um, big fan of hockey IQ. That would be the hockey IQ newsletter, also the podcast. But yes, thank you, Matt. Really appreciate that. All right. Thanks, Greg.